Um, so with the information that has been a part of the last few weeks, I think it's really important to work from a common conversation. And currently, Los Angeles County remains in the most restrictive tier, or as we're hearing it referred to recently, the purple tier. Um, that's also uh, described as being a widespread community transmission phase. This tier is based on both case rate and test positivity. And schools are not eligible to open right now. I want to say that more clearly because there continues to be questions about why we're not open. The reason that we're not open right now is really a very simple answer. It, it might not be a desirable answer, I acknowledge that, but it's a very simple answer. In the county of Los Angeles, of which we are a part, we are not able to reopen until the county has moved into the red tier or tier two and has been a part of that tier for a determined amount of time, which I will say today is currently 14 days, but I say that in clarification that that is the guidance today because one of the things that we have experienced as a part of this time that we have been living in since March is that guidance changes regularly. So as of today, we are part of the purple tier. We are not eligible to reopen as we move into a red tier, which there are many predictions, um, and we don't know if any of them are accurate about when that will happen, then we will be in the next conversation around what our reopening process may look like. Currently, Los Angeles County, so this week, has reopened, has opened a process for the ability to apply for a waiver. And so in response to some of the comments that we just heard that there has not been communication around our reopening status since September 10th, I will say that that has been specifically because prior to this week, there's been nothing new to share. But on Monday, Los Angeles County opened the opportunity for schools to apply for a waiver for students TK through second grade. Additionally, this week, um, beginning on Tuesday and with some revisions this morning, the Long Beach Health Department has also opened a waiver process for limited in-person instruction for TK through two. In this instance, Long Beach is acting as our own health jurisdiction. And for the first time in, this, in these last months, Long Beach is doing some things that are slightly in variation to what Los, Los Angeles County has been doing. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk about what that process within the Long Beach Health Department looks like. Um, as of this morning, they opened the process yesterday, but as of this morning, they've made some revisions and the process is that application for a waiver may be made by individual schools for TK through two instruction. I want to say that for Long Beach Unified and we're the only school district in Long Beach, we, those, any application that goes forward would be made in, with the support of the district and in conversation with those schools. And I'll talk a little bit more about the level of criteria that exists. The priority will be given to schools with a high percentage of free and reduced lunch recipients. And currently in the city of Long Beach, there has not been a defined number of sites that will be selected for a waiver by the city. <clears throat> Thank you. So here are some things, go back one, please, Letitia. Thank you so much for your help. Here are some things that the waiver application is requiring, and this is from the city of Long Beach. They are requiring a letter of support from the superintendent. They're requiring a level, level letter of support from all labor representatives, which for us is TALB and for CSEA. They're requiring a letter of support from parent organizations from any school that is applying. They're asking for demonstration of preparation for all health and safety protocols, including appropriate protective equipment, and we have been preparing and are prepared for that. They're asking for a plan for incorporating surveillance testing into regular school operations for all school employees. That means COVID testing for school employees. This is a new requirement. This is not something that's been required before. And this is something that we are activating on a plan so that we can be prepared for any possibility of what may happen next. 
They are requiring a flu vaccination pro program. This is not entirely new to us. We have, in tandem with the city, offered flu vaccination clinics prior. We have never had the requirement or any condition of employment be connected to flu vaccination, so this is new. They are also asking for training on contact tracing for involved staff that would be a part of any school that would seek uh, application on this waiver. And then the other thing that is rather obvious but not stated is waivers would be issued on the option that's parent, that schools could emphasize that they are prepared and ready with the health and safety protocols that are required. So in terms of our next steps, um, this is where we are in this process because I know that the obvious question is, and I, I see that the media is already covering the story that Long Beach has opened the opportunity for schools to apply for waivers. So the obvious question from our community is, well, are you going to do it? Where, where do you sit with this? And so I'll tell you exactly where we sit with it right now. In terms of our next steps, we are in ongoing communication with our labor partners regarding the waiver process because their support and specifically a letter of support is a criteria for us to proceed with any part of this process. We have had multiple conversations as last week ended and multiple conversations already this week with our labor partners. We are using analysis of data from in-person experiences that we have had to guide our next steps. I think it's important to note that since the middle of August, we have had our child development center, our health uh, Head Start, as well as Kids Club, actively supporting students in our facilities. In fact, we are serving currently about 1,600 students through those varying programs, either through childcare or as preschool. And we are learning from those experiences every week. We have had uh, several incidents of COVID exposure since we have been running these programs. Um, those exposures have not been substantial given the number of students that we are supporting, but we have found in every week that we have learned something about exposure and we have had cause to quarantine in, within these programs. And so the reason why I say that is because we want to be very careful in the way we proceed and we want to be sure that when we move forward, with a plan, any type of plan for reopening or bringing students back to our campus, that we can do so in a safe manner and that we can do so with as little disruption as possible. One of the criteria, and it's come up tonight so I'll address it, one of the questions that we've been asked is why January 28th? Why this January 28th date? Where did you get it and what is it for? And so I will say that that date we determined specifically in partnership with our health department we have consulted with them on decisions like this and we talked about that date as a possibility for several reasons. One, because we really want to avoid an opening and closing. It has been um, completely upsetting for our community to have to close schools at going back to March 13th. The messages that have come since that time around the need to continue distance learning, every single one, has been upsetting to our community and to our students and we acknowledge that. And the thing that we want to proceed very carefully about is that we are not too hasty in our decision making around bringing students back to campus and would cause us to have to close for any length of time going forward. And so our decision, and I, I realize that it, can, it has been met with some support and some real frustration. Our decision has been made to be prudent around the health data that we have, the impact of cold and flu season, and the desire to keep school open and moving forward as we phase in a reopening. So with those things in mind, the other piece of information around January 28th was that we aligned with the semester, which for elementary matters less, but for high school is critically important to the flow of the way that they take classes and receive credits for classes. The other thing that we'll be looking at, and I've mentioned it already, is our early study and consideration around the impact of cold and flu season as it begins. And we haven't really begun that season yet, but recognizing that every cold and flu related symptom is a symptom of COVID. We want to plan very carefully around the, uh, the fact that we don't want to be in an open and then close process. 
And then next, we are going to hear very shortly, Dr. Simon's going to come up and share a really well thought out plan with how we are moving forward with phasing in our students who have special needs. I wanna highlight just because the language becomes very confusing that the phasing in process is not a part of the waiver process. The waiver process is separate of phasing in. A waiver is something that we would choose as an option to apply for. Phasing in that Dr. Simon is going to come up and talk about is something that is a required component as we move forward for students with special needs. Um, so going into, let me just hit, uh-oh, I don't know if it's working. Thank you. So I wanna go into some information around the in-person um, phasing in for our students with disabilities. And as, thank you, Dr. Brown mentioned, um, the waiver and the in-person phasing for special education based on the guidance that we've received from um, Governor Newsom, our California Department of Public Health, and the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health um, is a tad bit different, right? So we know that with the waiver process, it's TK through second, it's very specific, it's even more stringent, more so than the in-person phasing in for a special education. But I, I wanna just take some time to discuss the guidance that we've received, and as Dr. Brown mentioned, um, that guidance changes frequently. So I, I just wanna warn some of our parents and our community members out there that tomorrow, um, this guidance could look different. Um, Friday, the guidance could look different. And I know that's confusing, and I know that's frustrating, um, it's a little frustrating for us sometimes as well as we begin to plan and have conversations with key stakeholders. But I just want to put that disclaimer out there just so our parents know. So if you hear something a little bit different tomorrow, it's not that we provided misinformation. It's just that the information just changes that frequently. So going into the guidance, the updated guidance, because it has changed so frequently, um, clarifies the conditions that must be met to offer in-person services for small groups of students if school is otherwise unable to reopen under state public health directives. And it also enables schools to provide limited in-person instruction, targeted support services, in-person assessments, which are truly vital at this time for our students with disabilities, and even for those general education students who are waiting in the wing to have those assessments conducted to see if they do qualify um, for special education services. And the facilitation of distance learning in small group environments for students with disabilities. So due to this guidance, a school district may allow a cohort of no more than 12 students and two adults, and no more than 10% of the overall population for purposes of instruction for these groups, even when schools are not fully open. And that's very vital. When you look at the cohort, so there's two adults, there's 12 students, and it could be no more, no more than 10% of the population. So for example, if there's a school of 300 students, right, only 30 students' bodies can be, right, at that school for this type of service. So that's very important as well as a very small handful cohort of students who can be a part of this. Next slide, please. Also, there's information about cohort mixing. So students within, let's just say, one cohort cannot be mixed into another cohort. And that's to minimize the exposure and also potential right contamination, as they mentioned. Um, cohorts must be kept separate from one another. So if we have, let's just say, two cohorts at one of our larger high school campuses, one of the classes have to be maybe on the far east side while the other class is on the far west side. So we have to be very conscientious of how spaced out right our students are as well. Other considerations, physical distancing. I know we've heard that, that terminology a lot about physical distancing. Um, also in collaboration with masking, there has to be cleaning and other safety measures that must be enforced also um, during this time that we have cohort of students returning back. So just quickly the phases, um, just to talk about what that may look like. And again, we are working in consultation with our health department just to ensure and also to release when we can start with these phases. So when you see these phases, you're not gonna see dates. <laughs> you're not gonna see timelines. You're just gonna see just phases because we have to 
also watch and consult and again have conversations with our public health officials. So phase one, and when I say pilot, I mean a very small handful of students who are receiving in-person assessments at the preschool assessment center at the Buffum Total Learning Center. So right now there's a very stringent protocol that's been up to place. Uh, we even had to push the timelines back on implementing this phase, if you will, um, because we wanted to make sure that things were tight, um, staff were properly trained, and that we had ample time to work with our custodial staff to talk about things that need to be sanitized, disinfected, and cleaned as far as our assessment protocols. We've started some work with our preschool assessment center, and that commenced on September 28, 2020, and I can tell you so far, so good. But we are still looking, we're having conversations, we're meeting with staff, just to make sure everyone feels safe, and to ensure that the protocols and procedures put in place are being followed. But again, a very small number of our students who are receiving the in-person assessments. And let me tell you why that's important. So since March 16th, we have not been able to conduct in-person assessments, of course, because of COVID-19. When you conduct virtual assessments, um, you also um, allow the opportunity for the assessments to be um, invalid or for your validity and re reliability to be questioned. So we have to be careful about not over-representing students within special education or adding more students into special education that naturally may not belong there, but sometimes when you conduct those virtual assessments, which is why some people don't like doing them, um, you run into that issue. So we are happy that we're able to start um, that in-person assessment phase. We have parents who've been waiting for six or seven months for assessments, just because there's been some type of moratorium on just providing those in-person assessments. So I'm happy that we're beginning to have those conversations, put things into place, put protocols and procedures in place where folks feel safe and our parents feel safe and our students feel safe to do so. The next phase, which will be phase two, would be our elementary assessments at school sites. So when I say elementary sites, that means all of our elementary sites, because I can tell you right now, we have pending assessments at each school site in this district, and we gotta get back to work somehow, some way, in a very safe way, so we're working on those pieces as well. Next slide, please. Phases three and four. So phases, phase three, excuse me, will consist of secondary assessments, and again, at every secondary site. And then phase four would be in-person services, in-person related services, right? So DHH, SLP, OT, PT, um, many of those things will need to be put in place in phase four. And then small groups, the small group instruction at select school sites. And there's gonna be a focus on our youngest, so those students who are at Buffum, our collaborative co-teaching program, our CCT program, um, our moderate to severe, our adult community transition program, um, our specialized healthcare program, and also our success program, which is for students with autism spectrum disorders. The students that I mentioned as far as the small group and in-person instruction are our most severe students with disabilities. Those who are just not learning, I know we have some parents even speak to um, students who are in general education and are not learning and having issues with focus and things of that nature. Uh, we know that these students are also having a very difficult time, if not more of a difficult time, um, just because they can't focus. Um, they cannot learn via Zoom. And so we're hoping to bring those students back again as quickly as possible. But again, that's gonna be within phase four as a watch and consult, um, because we have to be mindful of our flu season um, and other things that may come about um, during that time. And so that's pretty much it in regards to my presentation on the phasing in for students with disabilities. And I guess at this time we can open up for questions for our board members.